Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me. I'm just gonna wait another couple seconds to allow some other folks to log on. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So surprise, <laughs> I am not Joe Krolikowski. Um, unfortunately, Joe is out ill today and laryngitis being one of his uh, his symptoms. So I am filling in for him. Uh, my name is Lisa Arpino and I am the Assistant Accreditations Manager here at PJR. I also audit to 9001 and um, a couple other standards, 14001, which is environmental, 45,001, which is occupational health and safety, and also medical device, um, 13485. Um, so I'm very well versed with 9001. I hope that this will be a value added session for you. And I, of course, will be happy to answer any questions you might have on the presentation um, at the end of the presentation. So just a couple housekeeping items. Um, everyone is, is muted as a participant just to eliminate background noise. Um, there is a chat feature on your sidebar in GoToWebinar and also a question feature. If you have any comments or questions, um, I'll be checking that periodically, but I'm hoping to save questions to the very end of the presentation just for um, continuity sake. So we will definitely address all questions before we close. Um, and if anyone has anything they wanna pop in the chat, I'll try to keep that um, monitored as we go along, okay? All right, back online. There will be copies of the presentation available following this um, session, so you'll be able to download and review, okay? We also have a lot of other webinars that PJR hosts. You can check those out on our website. Um, look under previously recorded webinars if you wanna learn about some of the other um, areas that we cover as topics. Okay, so we're gonna dive right in with our overview of what today's session is going to cover. Um, we're gonna talk about what is ISO 9001 and kind of deconstruct the scope statement of ISO 9001. We're gonna talk about where ISO standards come from, um, the impact of, impact of the Annex SL, which is part of the standard. And then we're gonna go through sort of a cover to cover um, look at the standard, the 9001-2015 standard. We'll go over some key ideas, and then of course, we'll be able to conclude with remarks and questions. All right, so let's start with the general question, what is ISO 9001? So ISO 9001 is officially titled Quality Management Systems Requirements. Um, its intent is to provide um, what section 1.0 calls the scope. It's the statement that has not been changed in the last three editions of ISO 9001. So the international standard specifies requirements for a quality management system when an organization needs to demonstrate its ability to consistently provide products and services that meet customer and applicable statutory and regulatory requirements and aims to enhance customer satisfaction through the effective application of the system, including processes for improvement of the system and the insurance, excuse me, assurance of conformity to customer and applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. So let's deconstruct the scope statement a little bit, okay? What is the scope um, piece by piece? It's a vital part of understanding what ISO 9001 is all about. So the international standard specifies requirements for a quality management system. This opening declaration establishes a key requirement for the entire standard and any person or party that wishes to use it. So namely ISO 9001 is not a product standard. This is really important to understand. Um, it does not speak or intend to define 
how a product is manufactured. It's not intended to be used as a stamp of approval of conformity to any kind of um, product, you know, validity or uh, measure of quality. Um, it, it it seeks to certify an organization and demonstrate that there's commitment around quality from a company as a whole, um, independent of its products. Now, of course, it impacts its products, but it is not a product certification. The organization that seeks certification to ISO 9001 is still expected to define for itself how the products are made and controlled. So having all of the systems in place with ISO 9001, ideally will lend to high quality products. That's part of the idea, um, but we're definitely not giving any sort of special seal of approval on a piece of equipment or machinery that comes out of an ISO certified facility. Okay, when an organization needs to demonstrate its ability to consistently provide products and services, so that's another important caveat of the scope statement. The scope continues with this idea of services um, that wasn't necessarily included in earlier versions of the standard. So in the early years of ISO 9001, the thought was that it was primarily geared to organizations that manufactured tangible products. But as time progressed, it was clear that the principles of ISO 9 um, offer equal benefit to service-based organizations. And I'm sure as some of you are aware, um, it can actually be more challenging to sort of put some quality markers around a product that's a service because now we're dealing with an intangible item and people and some really different kinds of metrics and ways of measuring um, quality performance. All right, the scope states that um, the organization must meet customer and applicable statutory and regulatory requirements and aims to enhance customer satisfaction. So perhaps the central cornerstone of the ISO 9001 standard is its demand that organizations be very attuned, receptive, and responsive to the needs of their customers. And that can be both statutory requirements, regulatory requirements, depending on the industry, um, or just quality requirements in general, specific um, measurements, tolerances, labeling, whatever the case may be. All right, through the effective application of the system, including processes for improvement of the system and the insurance of conformity to customer and applicable statutory and regu regulatory requirements. These final statements acknowledge the ongoing nature of a quality management system. Uh, it's definitely not something that you implement and forget about. I think those of you that work with it um, know that it's a living and breathing beast. <laughs> um, we can't just say we're ISO certified and then, you know, we're good to go, forget about it. We definitely have to keep moving and, and keep evolving and changing and improving, uh, which leads us to that last point. The inclusion of improvement as a direct call out is also foreshadowing uh, for the importance of improvement on the overall nature of ISO 9001. All right, so let's dig in a little bit to where these standards come from. Um, the International Organization for Standardization, which is ISO, is a collective made up of numerous international members. So each standard is assigned a technical committee, it's TC for authorship. So TC 176 is the technical committee assigned specifically to ISO 9001. So this includes members from each of the major industrialized nations, um, including American National Standards Institute or ANSI, which you've probably seen that acronym floating around. To understand the ordering of clauses and content within ISO 9001 2015, uh, we must first explore a key document that was developed three years before ISO 9's uh, the 2015's publication, and that is Annex SL. So what is Annex SL? Uh, pretty obvious question. So Annex SL has also been referred to as the high-level outline or Annex XL, um, which always reminds me of a football jersey for some reason, like Super Bowl XX. Okay, Annex XL. 
Uh, it's part of a larger ISO publication called ISO slash IEC Directives Part 1, Consolidated ISO Supplement Procedures Specific to ISO. Um, so these directives and Annex SL can be downloaded for free from the ISO website, which is that www.iso.org. And there's certainly a lot of information on that site if you haven't visited. Um, definitely encourage you to kind of poke around and see what else is out there. Annex SL was first published in 2012 and represented the output of a special committee of the ISO called the Joint Technical Coordination Group, or JTCG. A 10-section blueprint for authoring all of the ISO family of standards is included in the Annex. It promotes, among other things, um, utilization of common terms and core definitions. All standards published by ISO, so including Again, even the ones that I also audit, um, the 14,001, the 45,001, whatnot, have completed their transition to an annex format. So you'll see there's a lot of um, synchronicity between the ISO standards in terms of how the annex is applied to each of the clauses. So as an example, on the left side of the screen, the Annex SL clause, um, it's just an example of how this appears in sort of all of the ISO standards. So in this 9.2.1 example, it will say the organization shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to provide information on whether the XXX, meaning QMS management system, environmental management system, fill in the blank. Um, and this language is then sort of copied and pasted into ISO 9001 itself, where then it says the organization shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to provide information on whether the quality management system, blah, 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 uh, conforms to, and then kind of keeps going by plugging that word quality in. So the idea of this example is just to kind of show how this verbiage is being used across multiple ISO standards. The Annex SL includes seven auditable sections, beginning with section four, and this is sort of getting into the meat and potatoes of what um, the ISO and the QMS auditing is all about. So starting with section four, which is context of the organization, uh, we're gonna talk about understanding the organization and its context, understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties, determining the scope of the quality management system, and the quality management system and its processes. Section five covers leadership and commitment. Uh, there's a general overview. There is a clause specific to customer focus, to the quality policy, and then to organizational roles, responsibilities, and authorities. Section six is devoted uh, to planning. Uh, specifically actions to address risks and opportunities, quality objectives and planning to achieve them, and the planning of changes, which can include not only document changes, but procedural changes, um, reporting changes, any of those items. Section seven talks about support. Support can be resources, which often covers human resources and people, um, competence, awareness, communication, and of course, documented information. Section eight covers operation, talking about operational planning and controls. So how are the company's processes being um, executed and then you know, monitored for conformance? Requirements for products and services, Again, services can be difficult when they're intangible, but we wanna make sure we have clearly defined criteria. Design and development of products and services. Of course, some clients do not do design and they're working with their customers' um, prints and things like that, so there are some exclusions that may apply. Control of externally provided processes, products, and services. This would cover things like um, vendor control, supplier control, Production and service provision, so pretty much operations. Uh, release of products and services. So some ISO standards require a final 
authorization by a named person. ISO 9 doesn't specifically, but we need to have a process in place to release the product, um, which is usually a final inspection of sorts. And then finally, control of non-conforming outputs. So before we release, if something's not conforming, what do we do with it? Section nine covers performance evaluation. So monitoring, measurement, analysis, and evaluation. This can be both um, people, processes, or calibration, like actual physical, tangible measuring. Um, also tools like internal audit and management review are used to evaluate performance. And then finally, improvement. So general overview of improvement. Uh, what to do with nonconformities and corrective actions to use those to improve and continual improvement in general. Um, like we said earlier, ISO is a, a dynamic document. It's a dynamic system. It never just, we don't finish and we stop and we're done and we don't have to do anything else. So we definitely want to find ways to continue to improve the quality management system. All right, so now let us dig into the standard itself with this cover to cover overview. Um, we're gonna kind of walk through each of the clauses, talk about some of the verbiage, what it means, how it can be applied, um, and then any key points around the specific clauses that maybe are, I don't wanna say more troublesome than others, but maybe the ones that generate the most headaches <laughs> or questions from, from clients and things that we tend to see repeatedly at PJR. Okay, so the introduction section starts with this 0 0.1, a general overview. It's an overview statement, um, intentions on whom the standard benefits, it introduces the ideas of risk-based thinking, PDCA, and explains four key terms. Um, three of these are getting official definitions for the first time with the 2015 revision. So the first one is shall. The word shall in the standard is a mandatory requirement. Okay, you're gonna see this word repeated over and over and over. If it says an organization shall do something, that means that they must do that in order to meet the clause requirement. The word should is used as a recommendation. You'll also see this throughout the standard quite a bit. Should means um, they don't have to do it verbatim, but as a good practice, they should consider um, X, Y, and Z. So we can't necessarily write a finding or a nonconformance against a should, but this might be one of those areas where um, there is a potential for a failure if they're not following that specific clause. Uh, may is used as a uh, sort of an interchangeable term for permission. And then the word can as a possibility or a capability. All right, 0 0.2, the seven quality management principles uh, with reference to the ISO 9001 standard are given here. And those are customer focus, leadership, engagement of people, process approach, improvement, evidence-based decision-making and relationship management. A lot of these sort of overlap each other, um, which is why they're really effective pillars of the standard. Uh, 0 0.3 talks about process approach, reinforcement of the process approach and improved graphic therein, reinforcement of plan, do, check, act, which is PDCA, and an improved graphic therein. So this has been another uh, real kind of shift with the 2015 version where we really want to do a process-based audit as opposed to a clause-by-clause -clause audit when we are looking at a client's um, quality management system. 0 0.3.3 .3 talks about risk-based thinking. Uh, there's a definition and an explanation of importance there. And then 0 0.4, relationship with other management system standards. So ISO 9000, ISO 9004 um, kind of talks about the evolution and, and some of the relationships there. All right, section one related to scope. There is general verbiage related to the applicability of ISO 9001. 
Section 2 offers some normative references, linkage to ISO 9000 for all official terms and definitions. And then Section 3, of course, with more terms and definitions. Um, there's currently not a lot of content here, but it's going to be a placeholder for ISO 9001 specific definitions. And then we talked already about what section sections four through 10, um, the content that they already have. So we'll dig into those a little bit further here in a moment. And then we talk about Annex A, which is an informative section of uh, the standard that's sort of meant to supplement the rest of the standard. So there's some several key points of information and counsel to be found here. As an auditor um, or as a consultant for your client, you know, you're definitely going to want to be familiar with these annex clauses because sometimes it will offer a little bit of a different perspective on a clause or a different slant that will help you either, um, you know, change your approach or modify an approach, look at the clause maybe a little bit differently to make sure that there's full conformance. A1 talks about structure and terminology. So it's reinforcing the doctrine that an organization does not have to align their documentation to match ISO uh, 9001, nor does it have to use the specific terms found in the standard. And this is a pretty significant change from the previous editions. So we're not looking for a clause by clause, um, you know, A for A, B for B sort of match with their quality manual. Their uh, products and services, A2, a fuller explanation of intent in changing all references of product to read both products and services. So again, a, a broader uh, spectrum. A3 talks about understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties, uh, a more full explanation of intent in the identification of interested parties. Again, we don't want to think of just customers as our interested parties, but Oftentimes, it's you know our it's our own employees, it's our communities, it's um, again taking a, a broader view from maybe 30,000 feet instead of only 500 feet to really consider some uh, inter interested parties that might not be first tier. And then risk-based thinking, A4, an extensive section intended to assist in the more full understanding of this concept, emphasizing that a formal structure or process for risk management is not required. A5, applicability, is further discussion on the logic of removing the word exclusions from the ISO 9001 standard and now replacing it with the term non-applicables. A6, documented information, offers some further discussion on the new term that has replaced procedure, record, and document. A7 for organizational knowledge is an explanation of requirements pertaining to competency and ongoing competency through various challenges an organization might face. And A8, control of externally provided products and services, provides an expansive explanation of this phrase and who it applies to. So some good information in there. Okay, further extensive discussion on the relationship between ISO 9001 and other publications can be find, found in Annex B of the standard. And then lastly, the bibliography. All right, so key ideas found in ISO 9001. Over the next several slides, um, to give you an introduction to some of the more important fundamental ideas postulated by ISO 9, including causal linkages, linkages where possible. Uh, we're gonna look at scope, processes, accountability, effectiveness, and improvement. All right, key idea one, so let's talk about scope. Early in the standard in section 4.3, the organization is directed to develop a scope statement. Uh, the scope statement represents the extent and boundaries of your quality management system. So here are a few examples. And essentially, in PJR world, we say you're doing something to something, okay? Are you taking a material, you're doing something to it, and you're doing something with it, right? So design, fabrication, and assembly of collapsible tripods is one example. 
Distribution of fasteners is another example. Plating, heat treating, sorting of metal stampings. A scope statement is not geographical, okay? It's not um, the scope covers this building. The scope covers, um, you know, our sales office and, and our warehouse and our manufacturing facility. The scope needs to cover the activities that the organization is performing and the materials that they're performing it to or the product. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a tangible material. Ideally, the scope statement that you develop will eventually be the same as that shown on your ISO certificate issued by PJR. So it's a big one that um, our accreditors, so the ANAB and UCAS have been on us quite a bit with some of the certificates they've sampled. Um, don't list an item on your scope that won't be available for an audit. It's really important. So if an organization says um, they're doing field installation in their scope statement, um, then they need to provide a remote audit of the field installation activity if they want that to be listed. An organization that has purchased new equipment that isn't up and running yet, we can't claim that on part of the scope if it's not able to be audited. Remember that a scope can always be changed, but we can't issue a certificate for an activity or for an item um, that isn't part of the organization's process at the time of certification. Be careful about being too wordy in your scope statement. So now we've kind of gone <laughs> the opposite direction. So consider the following scenario. An organization has the following as their scope statement. Laser cutting, water jet cutting, progressive die cutting, plating, heat treating, and distribution of flanges, springs, shims, bolts, and barrels. Okay, very, very pres prescriptive. So in the above example, PJR would have to audit laser cutting, water jet cutting, progressive die cutting. You get the idea, right? We have to audit every single activity. And further, uh, we also have to ensure that every product group is sampled. So we need to then sample flanges, springs, shims, bolts, and barrels. And I will also add, it really limits you from adding more materials or adding more processes because now you've gotten so um, sort of laser focused, no pun intended, on, on your activities and your materials that um, trying to change that or, you know, we don't want to have to add, I don't know, plastics. <laughs> so we talk about processes, right? And this is what the scope is covering. Another core idea that's mentioned early on in the standard is that the organization needs to determine exactly what their processes are and how they interface. Um, section 4.4 states very que clearly that a quality management system is made up of processes. And this concept of process approach is again um, a key one in the world of ISO standards. So PJR offers an entire webinar called The Interaction of Processes and Its Importance. Uh, if you want more information on that, check out the website and um, obviously check out the content of that webinar. It goes into pretty sufficient depth. The concept of processes cascades throughout the 9001 standard, including but not limited to some of these clauses. So use of process approach is first mentioned in clause 5.1. Um, aligning quality objectives to processes is discussed in 6.2 as part of planning. Ensuring competent staff for available, ensuring competent staff is available for all processes is discussed in clauses um, 7.1.2 and 7.1.6. Ensuring effective infrastructure for all processes is discussed in 7.1.3. Control over external processes in 8.4, and then review of process performance specified in 9.3.2. So it's just some examples of that word process that you're going to see over and over and over again um, as you read through the standard. So we encourage you to make your processes as personal and unique to your business as possible. This goes a long way in ensuring that your quality management system is adding value to your organization, right? This isn't a cookie cutter. I can't take one client's quality management program or their audit program, copy and paste it into another organization that has 
you know, more or fewer employees, is doing different activities, has some unique challenges. It really needs to be specific to your organization. So resist the urge to name your processes after sections of the ISO 9 standard. This is something we see repeatedly over and over when we go to look at an internal audit or an audit program. Uh, we understand that documentation and the actual physical paper standard is very important, but we want to see that you are auditing your processes for effectiveness. That doesn't mean I'm going to audit my quality manual and I am going to audit my documentation and my procedures. Take it a step further get into your manufacturing area, get into your purchasing, pull some objective evidence, ensure that your SOPs are being translated um, into those processes themselves and not just a clause by clause overview. So when you create your scope statement and you're creating your QMS, it's very important to consider the specific processes and how they interact from you know, entry point input all the way through to output. ISO 9001 demands inclusion of all persons that fall within the scope of the quality management system. So this mostly is addressed in section 5.1.1 where the standard demands that top management make itself accountable for the effectiveness of the quality management system. Obviously we know that um, a top-down effect is essential. Um, so we wanna make sure that the goals of the QMS, the objectives, the values, all of that around the quality system starts at the top and is getting filtered all the way down to every level of the organization. So other key places where accountability is demanded when we talk about accountability, product release records must name names. We kind of touched on this briefly earlier. So we definitely wanna have um, accountable person, some sign-offs on, on inspection reports or whatnot to make sure that there is accountability for release of product. Problems, including complaints, must be responded to with appropriate systematic action. There's got to be some accountability there as well. Organizations must define roles, responsibilities, and authorities. That's in Clause 5.3. All personnel must be cognizant of the quality policy, that's in clause 5.2, and how they contribute to the effectiveness of the quality management system, that's clause 7.3. So a really simple question, you can ask your employees, um, how are you contributing to your quality management system? What is it? What do you specifically do to impact the objectives, the targets, the, uh, you know, the big picture? If they can't tell you, there's some work that needs to be done. Uh, key idea number four, so let's talk about effectiveness. ISO 9001 has numerous requirements that require the organization to measure the effectiveness of something. So kind of touched on this earlier. The idea is that the organization should know at any given time how well or how poorly things are going in their operation. So the basic idea of effectiveness measures begins and is most succinctly established in Clause 4.4.1c, um, where it states that the organization must determine and apply the criteria and methods, including monitoring, measurements, and related performance indicators needed to ensure the effective operation and control of processes. So again, this can be your calibration. This can be physical measuring. It can be um, customer satisfaction surveys. It can be training records or a measurement of training effectiveness or performance of use, supplier evaluations. This can be internal audits, management reviews, where you're looking at data and analyzing where you are, um, quality inspections. I mean, this is a very broad um, sort of clause, but you need to apply this specifically to your organization. How are you measuring your own objectives and targets throughout the process? So key areas where the idea of effectiveness measures is discussed, um, and I kind of just mentioned a few of these, but tracking of your quality objectives in section 6.2, evaluation of competency actions, 7.2, evaluation of external provider performance is 8.4, product and service inspection, 8.6, Customer satisfaction example 
overall trending of the quality management system, 9.1.3. Um, assessment of the system via internal audits there, 9.2. Review of key system aspects via management review, 9.3. And then efforts targeting improvement, 10.1. So if you need the clauses that go along with it, there you go. <laughs> All right, finally, let's talk about improvement. So the final cornerstone concept we'll look at is improvement. And as we currently discussed, improvement represents an evolution of an older concept called continual improvement. The current concept of improvement acknowledges that improvement is possible in a number of key ways. Um, continual improvement is one of them, but also reactive changes, breakthroughs, um, new ideas, not just the idea of continual improvement. It's explored primarily in section 10.1. Uh, the clause indicates that the organization must, and there's that word shall, the organization shall determine and select opportunities for improvement and implement any necessary actions to meet customer requirements and enhance customer satisfaction. Okay, like the other key ideas we've discussed, improvement is revisited as a concept again and again throughout ISO 9, that is true. Section 4.4 states that the organization must continually improve. 5.1.1 uh, states that the management must promote improvement. Section 5.2.1 states that the quality policy must address continual improvement as well. 5.3c states that assigned responsibilities must include reporting on opportunities for improvement. 6.1 states that risk action efforts should target improvement. Section 7.1 states that resources should enable the organization to achieve continual improvement. 7.3, that persons who work for the organizations should be aware that their efforts impact improvement. And 9.3.2 there, um, that opportunities for improvement should be among the items discussed in management review meetings. All right, we've gone through a lot of things cover to cover. It's a lot of pages. So <laughs> as a conclusion, ISO 9001 2015 remains the world's most utilized standard. Um, just over 900,000 registered companies. It really is the most, um, globally used standard, the most clients in the world. Organizations seeking certification to ISO 9 um, would do well to bear in mind the big picture of what ISO 9001-2015 seeks to promote. Um, and that's kind of an important concept. You know, we sometimes get really granular and lose sight of the overall goal. I know there's a lot of information in that standard and a lot of shales, um, but we kind of need to take a step back sometimes and just make sure as an organization we're doing what we're setting out to do. You know, we talk about strategic direction and then we can kind of break it down um, from the top of the pyramid or I guess the bottom going up to the small point, like go from the big picture and then weed it down. If you are interested in taking a deeper dive into the standard, we also offer a clause by clause primer course for anyone who's new to the standard and needs to have a better understanding in preparation for an audit or for other purposes. And that is called ISO 9001 2015, a clause by clause analysis. It can be found on our website and it's free. Yay, everybody likes free things. So um, check that out if you are interested. We've got some other webinars that we offer. Um, one is anticipating auditor expectations in key areas. That's offered semi-annually, so check back and see when that's going to be offered. Your ongoing relationship with PJR will be premiering soon. This is gonna be a brand new webinar that explores the various resources that PJR has at its disposal for those things when or times when things change in your organization. Um, it will also include an in-depth review of the unpleasant but necessary dispute process. So that's definitely um, a tool that you have, you know, in the event that you get audited by PJR and maybe don't agree with a particular finding. We want to make sure you understand that process. 
the interaction of processes and its importance to a successful audit. So this webinar explores the crucial topic of processes and how to correctly understand them. So we talked about that today. If you feel like you need a little more clarity on um, how to define your processes or how to make a process map, this would be a good webinar to attend. And then there's a lot of other information on our website um, for other topics, including stage one audits, and then some of the other standards listed there, aerospace, um, ISO 1345, which is medical devices, IETF, automotive, ISO 14001, environmental. If you would like to keep in touch and want to be informed automatically of some of these new webinars and things coming out, um, be sure that you opt in for future updates by visiting our website. And it's uh, www.pjr.com. There's a whole section on webinars, so you'll be able to go in there and um, sign up for the ones you're interested in or you know, opt in to receive alerts. At the bottom of the page, you'll enter your email address in the provided space and then just click subscribe. All right, so just as a reminder before we start taking some questions and wrap up, um, copies of today's presentation will be available for download. And all of these webinars that we do are recorded. If mine is not recorded today, almost identical content with probably Joe's more seasoned uh, radio voice will be available under previously recorded webinars. Um, so definitely check those out if you would like to get some additional information. Okay, so at this time, I will happily open up the floor. If there are any questions, um, please be sure to type those into the chat and I am happy to answer. I'll just give this a few minutes because I know sometimes chat features and question boxes don't work the way we want them to. <laughs> Okay, question is, will an org chart be sufficient? So an org chart identifies people and um, key positions in the company. So it might show the president, the vice president, the quality manager. Um, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't see the entire question. Let me scroll this down. Oh. Yeah, that was the question, okay. Um, an org chart is not going to replace an interaction of processes map. So it's going to show who's who in the company and who reports to who and who your key decision makers are with roles and responsibilities, if that's what you're asking. Um, we definitely in, in terms of your management team or in your process map, want to know who's impacting decisions along the way. So if you have a procedure written for let's just say a manufacturing procedure uh, you definitely want to have in there who's responsible for doing uh, your inspections who can sign off on final product who is assigned to do internal audits who can make decisions on um, responding to customer complaints and things so an organizational chart is a piece of that and it can include that if you want to go into that much detail in an org chart but we also want to see those roles and responsibilities um, that the standard specifically calls out defined a little more clearly in the procedures themselves or maybe in the quality manual. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, can I get confirmation of attendance for my ASQ cert? So I will, I do believe, and I apologize because I'm not the usual roster for this course. I'm, I'm a fill-in today, um, but I am like 99% sure that there are certificates issued for attendees. Um, I'm going to check with our um, moderator who normally is the one that posts all the content and the downloads. If for whatever reason you don't receive a certificate, um, please email and I'm going to figure out which email um, it would be the same the same PJR email or the same spot in the um, PJR website that you went to register register you can send an email to that address and we can get you a certificate but I'm like literally almost positive there are certificates issued okay
Any other questions? Okay, I missed the first part of the presentation. Can I get the record? Yeah, I think we already covered that. So the um, everything will be covered, or excuse me, available for download um, once this is complete and there are recorded sessions that you can view also. How do you differentiate between manufacturing process, I'm sorry, manufacturing process and QMS process? I think what you're asking is, if I may, Andrew, um, so a manufacturing specific process would be something like heat treating, um, plating, laser cutting. That's a manufacturing specific process. A QMS process, if that is how you've decided to name your processes, might be something like, um, control of non-conforming product, um, customer feedback. There might be a process that's more big picture as opposed to the granular processes that are related specifically to manufacturing. Manufacturing as a whole, production as a whole, um, big picture might be an overlying process of your quality management system, but then broken down further those specific manufacturing processes would likely appear on the IOP or that interaction map. I hope that's answered sufficiently. Okay, I'm just scrolling through. Great information, thank you, I appreciate that. Do you have any recommendations for KPIs for design for companies that perform digital services and products? Good question. So the important thing with KPIs that I, I feel like some clients sometimes get caught in the weeds, um, they, are, they don't want to put a number on something. Um, they want to say, um, you know, we're going to improve our sales, which I'm using as an example that is not a quality. <laughs> we don't actually care about sales from the quality perspective. Um, of course, it's a metric, but um, digital marketing, for example, maybe you're tracking customer satisfaction. Let's use that as an example. Um, a KPI may be a customer satisfaction rating, not necessarily just we want satisfied customers. That's great, but it does need to be measurable. You can decide what that is. If you've got a, a scale, let's say a, a rating, you know, one out of five, two out of five, and you want to have a five out of five or a four out of five, and you just pick what that criteria is, um, whatever you define it to be, whatever you define your KPIs, they just have to be measurable. So in terms of, and I just wanna make sure I'm getting my arms around, yeah, digital services and products, um, that might be, I think, you know, customer service would probably be one way to look at it, or um, complaints might be another way, or any issues you encounter, maybe even turnover or something like that, that you wouldn't think would be a metric, but it's it's talking to your commitment of your people, just kind of throwing out some ideas, but, you know, look at, at what's important and, and the processes that are involved in your company. Um, and then determine exactly what it is that's driving the success of the QMS. It can't be sales like we talked about because in QMS world, sky's the limit on sales. We just want quality. <laughs> I feel like that was sort of a wordy answer. So I apologize if it wasn't completely on, on target. Um, do you have a specific link to find previous, previously recorded webinars? Yep, it's in the screen that I have up right now. Um, there should be a link. So when you log on the PJR website, there should be a little webinar. It says go and you can click on the webinar little image. And from there, it should take you to the webinar page where I believe there's a, um, a section for previously recorded webinars. I hope that's where, where it is. Okay. What examples of employee competency do auditors like to see? Great question. Um, 
so for ISO 9001, um, it pretty specifically calls out that you need to determine what the criteria is for folks in various positions and then retain documented information that you are confident those folks are meeting the criteria that you set. Um, this is actually a really, I would say, a, a frequently missed clause. In a, in a minor non-conformance kind of way, because sometimes companies will be very, very prescriptive. They'll say, the quality manager needs to have a four-year degree in engineering. They need to have 10 years of, ex of experience in manufacturing. They need to have experience with this particular ERP platform or whatever the case may be. And then they've got a really great candidate who maybe has worked with the company for the last 15 years doesn't maybe have the right degree, but they're, they're a superstar. So they say, we're gonna make them quality manager, right? And they're, they're doing a great job. Well, when we go back and audit and say, can you show me the competency requirements? They pull up this job description and say, this is what, this is what they're supposed to have. And then we say, okay, show me that this candidate, uh, you know, Bill Smith is meeting all those criteria. And they go, oh, well, he's really good. He's been here forever. Yes, we know that. But if you have defined that your people need to have a certain level of education, of skill, or of experience. You need to be able to then demonstrate through documentation that they have that. So I like to say, not that we can consult when we audit, but there is a big difference between the word preferred and the word required, okay? So if your people are required to have something by your own definition, then they need to have it. If they are preferred, or if there's some sort of caveat that, um, you know, an exception can be made based on an equivalent experience or blah, 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 however you define that. Um, that is definitely an area that we see missed kind of a lot. So Tony, I hope that answers your question. Okay, I'm able to get a step-by-step -step guide into what to expect during an audit. This will be my first audit, awesome. I hope it goes very smoothly. Audits are not scary. I mean, they are and they are, they're not. You should have fun during your audit. I like to have fun during audits. Um, the intention is not to freak anybody out. So, and ultimately remember that your auditor is there to, to help you. Everyone's on the same page. You know, we don't come into a client with our clipboards and our pens and ready to write a whole slew of non-conformances. That's no fun for anybody. Um, we really want to look for conformance and help you improve if we see something that's not quite conforming. Um, if this is your first audit, I will say for any, any of you on the call that are seeking certification or kind of in that process, non-conformances are not demerits. They're not indicators that you are doing anything wrong. They are just that. They are non-conformances and it's opportunity for improvement. And you should expect a couple non-conformances as part of your registration audit. It is just extremely common. Don't beat yourselves up. Um, it's also a really good exercise in preparing a corrective action response that I think is value added. So I get some you know, companies and some CEOs that think, their team is failing if they are issued a minor non-conformance and that just please don't think about it like that we at pjr get audited like a million times a year and we get non-conformances too quite a few of them across all of our programs and we also have to put together corrective action responses so we're in it too okay how long it takes to get iso and how much so I don't have a specific answer. It's going to be very dependent on your organization, what you do, how many people you have. There are some really specific accreditation rules about audit time and how we um, determine how many days an audit should be, um, what standard you're looking at. If it's just ISO 9 for this particular webinar, um, I think there's a pretty cut and dry you know, daily cost but there are discounts that can be applied based on risk, if you're doing a high risk activity or not. 
if you have folks that speak multiple languages and we need to add time for translation, there's a lot of different variables. So if you are interested in getting a quote, um, getting a quote doesn't obligate you to come on board with us. You can absolutely reach out to our sales team through the website and there is a, a button on the website for get a quote um, and you will be connected directly to one of our sales reps like very, very quickly. I mean, within a few hours, if not immediately. How long do you keep audit results? A year, three years for the life of the product. Um, so Tim, specifically for ISO 9001, there is no requirement for how long you keep audit results. Definitely we wanna be seeing, you know, a, a certification is a three year cycle. So we definitely would wanna see you retaining that information for the life of, of a cycle. So if you are certified this year in 2023, the following year in 2024, you would have a surveillance following year in 2025, a second surveillance, and then recertification would happen on year three. Um, at PJR, when we are preparing, as an auditor, when we're preparing to do your research, we're looking back at the full three-year cycle to see if there's any trends. Are there repeat non-conformances in an area? Um, has there been improvement overall? Has there been non-improvement or maybe things have gotten worse? Um, we want to retain that information, so we would expect that you would also retain that information and be able to identify um, like big picture trends in the QMS. Some standards, like medical device, for example, require that there is a lot of documentation retained for the life of a product. That's not a, an ISO 9 requirement, um, so it's just going to depend on your products, your company, and what you think makes sense. Um, but in terms of just an audit cycle for purposes of auditing, definitely keep it for the, the, the full cycle, okay? I apologize, my screen froze. I hope you can hear me right now. I've got the little spinning circle of death, but that should come back in just a second. Okay, I think we've hit our time limit. We're just about there. I wanna thank everybody for joining today. I hope that this has been value added. Um, of course, if you have any more questions or want further information, please visit our website. There are um, lots of areas for you to reach out and contact uh, members of our team um, and to also look at some of those previously recorded webinars for additional information. So um, thank you very much for your, your attention today and um, best of luck to all of you as you are seeking ISO certification or continuing your journey with ISO.